Chapter 5. The Bridge They made good time that afternoon. Black mountain pines gave way to maples, chestnuts, and paper birches, and larger clearings. Flashes of bright color darted through the tree canopy as the sunbirds began their afternoon's homage to the sun. Suddenly the travelers emerged onto a long, wide grass shelf. Ahead the land fell into a vast gorge. Approaching the edge, Dane looked down and whistled. Far, far below lay a thin silver curl, a river. Long Drop Gorge, the badger told them. Nodding at two splintery logs planted upright in the ground at the cliff's edge, he added, And there's the first bridge. What had looked like the sturdy enough wooden rope construction in the vision over Weirin's map was in reality fraying, twisted hemp and ancient slats. Twin ropes, as old and unreliable looking as the rope of the floor, were strung at rails at waist height and attached to the logs. The whole structure didn't look as if it would support even one of them, let alone their whole group. The first rope and wood bridge, corrected the duckmole. The first rope bridge is farther up. We didn't think you'd like that. First bridge or first wooden rope bridge, it won't break, snapped the badger. It was set here after the first humans were done with it, and it's been here ever since. No force in the divine realms may break it until the realms themselves are broken. Is there an easier way to cross? Numa asked. Anywhere? Both gods shook their heads. Long Drop Gorge extends several days' march in both directions, explained Broadfoot. You did say you were in a hurry. Would you be able to carry our belongings if you and Broadfoot transported yourselves across? The man wanted to know. No, said the duckmole. Weirin and Sarah both put some of their power into what you carry to help you. Those things are bound to you. If we tried to take them, they would not come. Numer eyed the crystal in his staff and said dryly, I didn't know Weirin cared. Dane looked at the canyon floor again and winced. It was just too far down. First bridge or no, the thought of seeing that distant ribbon far under her toes made her sweat. I could take eagle shape, she thought. Heights never bother me when I fly. That was no good. Numer carried his staff. She couldn't burden him with her belongings, not when he'd need a free hand to grasp one of the ropes that served as rails. An arm slipped around her shoulders. Are you all right? Numer asked. Heights don't bother you. It's the bridge as much as the height, she replied. I will carry our things if you want to shift, he told her softly. A shape change is out of the question for me. We must keep our food and weapons, for one. For another, I would hate to use my gift to fly across, then need to handle trouble on the other side. If we are going today, let us begin, urged the badger. I would like to be across before anyone, or anything, else comes by. The thought of being caught on that bridge by an enemy made Dane's stomach roll. He's right. She tried to smile at Numer. We best start walking. Numer put down the duck bowl and stood back. Silver fire bloomed and shrank. The gods vanished to reappear on the far side of the canyon. Dane insisted that Numer go first and tried not to watch as he carefully moved away from the cliff. When he was well ahead, she bit her lip and stepped onto the first plank. It shuddered beneath her weight. The whole structure shook with her friend's movement. Trembling, she seized the rope handholds, firmly with her right hand, awkwardly with her left, the one in which she carried the bow. Numer slipped, making the bridge rock. Like Dane, he'd managed the barest holds on the left-hand rope, hampered by his staff. "'It takes getting used to,' he called to her. "'It stood for time out of mind,' the badger's voice came from the air near them. "'That's what I'm afraid of,' they both chorused. Numer glanced back at the girl and grinned. She had to smile as well. Carefully, he walked on, eyes on the planks before him. She'd meant to keep her eyes forward. Instantly, she discovered that would be impossible. Gaps lay between the wide boards. To avoid putting a foot through an opening, she had to look where she stepped, and was treated to a view of the river as it wound between tall, jagged rocks far below. She forged ahead, a step at a time. Away from the cliff, she walked into a brisk, playful breeze. Of course, she growled. What would a first bridge be without its own plank-rocking first wind? Movement pulled her attention to her chest rather than her footing. Shimmering with light, the darking that had been tucked into her belt purse now hung by a tentacle from her belt. The other darking had flowed off her neck to swarm over the belt darking, hitting it with tentacles shaped like hammers. She heard small plops as each blow landed. Here, you two! Stop it! This isn't the time! What's wrong? The breeze was strong enough the Numero was forced to shout. He was more than forty yards distant, a third of the way across the bridge. I don't know, she yelled. It's the darkings. Enough, 
she told her passengers. Clutching the left hand hold with fingers still wrapped around her bow, she released the right hand rope and grabbed the top darking. She pulled it away from the one on her belt and stuffed it down the back of her shirt. Seizing the belt darking, she held it up. Examining the darking, she gasped and nearly dropped it. Its center was filled by Osorn's face. He grinned and waved, then vanished. The darking was solid shadow once more. Dane stuffed it into her belt purse and tied the pouch shut with one hand. As she seized the right handhold again, her magical senses prickled. Wind made the bridge jump. Clinging to the rails, the girl looked for the disturbance. Far overhead, the sky rippled. Uh-oh, she whispered. Like the Taurus, something, or someone, was crossing from one realm to the other. Winged shapes came into view, as if they flew through a waterfall or beaded curtain. Please let them be friendly, Dane thought, shaping her own eyes to those of an eagle. Now she saw the new arrivals clearly, horse-shaped, with powerful bat-like wings and a predator's talons and fangs. They were not at all friendly. Herox! She yelled to Numer, pointing. Eleven of them! The immortals drew their wings in and dropped, coming for the bridge like plummeting falcons. Numer planted his feet and raised his staff, holding the rail with his right hand. The girl couldn't afford a handhold. Kneeling, spreading her legs to balance herself, she grabbed two arrows. One she put to the string, the other she held in her teeth. She refused to think about the rocking bridge or the gaps on either side. Five Hurrocks formed the first attacking wave. Carefully, Dane selected a target. Blackfire shot from the crystal on Numer's staff, even as the girl loosed. The Hurrock, struck by the mage, burst into flame and dropped. Another screamed in rage. Dane's arrow had grazed its chest and punctured a wing. With her second arrow, Dane shot the next Hurrock coming in. It shrieked and fell, her shaft through one eye. She yanked two more arrows from her quiver, putting one between her teeth, one to the string. Sharp pain dragged across her scalp. A hurrock had come from behind to rake her with his claws. As momentum carried him far below into the gorge, the impact of a strike knocked Dane forward. The arrow in her bow fell as something ink-colored hit the board in front of her. Dane flinched. It was a darking. Keening, it clamped onto the board, locking itself down with half a dozen tentacles. She couldn't believe it might attack. Something in its shrill cries told her it was just too busy keeping itself from dropping into the gorge to do her an injury. Rolling, hampered by her pack and trying not to crush her quiver, she put her second arrow to the string. Carefully, she turned over, tracking the hurrock with her blood on his talons. Correcting for wind, she loosed. The arrow soared across the air below to plunge into the hurrock's belly. Shrilling, he tried to claw the missile from his flesh as he dropped. Two more attackers plummeted, one set ablaze by Numer, another fighting silver fog wrapped around its muzzle. The animal gods had joined the fight. Dane sat up, holding the bow at an angle to keep it from tangling in rope or boards, and groped for her quiver. Two arrows met her fingers. Glancing back, she saw that the darking she'd put into her shirt was spread over the quiver's top. It had saved her arrows from the chasm. Now it handed them to her. Thank you, she whispered, getting to her knees again. She touched the back of her skull, wetness trickled through her curls. Hope you don't mind getting blood on. Other Hurrocks, including the one that she had first wounded, spiraled down to the attack. Dane shot and killed the injured Hurrock. A sparkling black net enveloped a pair of the Immortals and exploded, leaving nothing. Two more Hurrocks, one nearby, one higher up, dodged frantically, trying to evade the Badger's deadly silver fireballs. Coldly, Dane drew the bowstring back to her ear. Silver fire overtook the Hurrock farthest from her. It turned black and charred, dissolving as it fell. The last Hurrock, screaming its rage, plunged toward Dane, claws outstretched. The girl shot. The arrow flew as neatly as if she were in the practice yards of the palace. It slammed into the Hurrock's throat, cutting off its scream. The immortal beat its wings to stop and flew right into sparkling fire. Instantly transformed into a charred skeleton, it broke up, raining into the canyon. Carefully, Dane put down her bow. I want to go home, she whispered. I've had enough excitement for a while. A darking head peered over her shoulder. You have some explaining to do, she told it. The one in my pouch was spying on us, wasn't it? The darking squeaked and hung its head. Dane pointed to the darking that clutched the plank. What about this one? Is it coming with us? The darking on her back squeaked at the newcomer. It trembled like jelly and finally shrilled a reply. Her passenger nodded to Dane. Is it a spy too? The small inky head showed empathetically. The newcomer was no spy. Well, it's certainly a deserter from Osorn's army, at the very least. Carefully, the girl reached forward to peel the newcomer off the board. Quivering, it pooled in her hand. Why did you come over to my side, hmm? Dane, called the mage. May we move on? Sorry, 
she yelled. Just a moment. To the darking, she said, you'd better come up with some answers that make sense, and soon. She dropped the newest of the blots inside her shirt. The darking on her shoulder stuck its head under her collar. Their soft, peeping conversation was drowned out by the creaking of the bridge as Dane carefully got to her feet. Gripping the rope handholds, she caught up to Numer. You're hurt, he said, touching the back of her head when she reached him. The girl winced. I'll tend it later, though. Let's get off this thing. I don't know, she remarked, following. It seems like a nice little bridge. He looked back at her, eyebrows raised. It never dumped us now, did it? And it could have. Yours is a happy nature, the mage answered dry. I confess, this is too much like excitement for me. It could be worse, Dane said, and giggled. It could be raining. Numor shook his head, then returned his attention to crossing the bridge. I wonder if that hurrock struck your head a little too hard. Nonsense, the girl retorted. I couldn't have shot straight if it had. When they stepped off the bridge, Numor swept her into a tight hug and examined her scalp as he held her. Dane rested gratefully against him. He had sounded calm on the bridge, but his heart pounded. His shirt was sweat-soaked. We should clean this, he remarked over her head. Didn't Sarah give you ointment for injuries? Mm-hmm. Dane rubbed her nose in the patch of chest hair that peeked through the V of his shirt collar. He drew back. Stop it, he said sharply. I can't think when you do that. You think too much, she retorted, but she stopped anyway. I smell water, said Broadfoot. Fish and frogs, too. Let's find it, the badger ordered, before something else happens. They found their way down into a valley. It was cut in two by a lively stream that flowed out of a deep pool. Broadfoot plunged in. Seconds later, Dane saw him on the bottom, riffling through sand and rocks with his bill. On Numer's orders, Dane washed out her cuts. The darking that had deserted the hurrock remained inside her shirt, clinging to her waist, enduring without complaint the cold water that dripped onto it. The darking that had protected her arrows helped the man to gather firewood. The third darking remained in Dane's belt purse. She ignored its bumping as she dipped water and poured it over her aching head. Badger hunted for his supper among the ground squirrel, snake, and mice gods nearby. By the time he returned, the fire was burning well, and a pot of tea water was heating. Dane submitted patiently as Numor examined her scalp wounds, made sure they were clean of grit, and rubbed ointment into them. Neither he nor the girl were much surprised when the cuts healed as the ointment was applied. She said the herbs she finds here are more powerful, Dane remarked when Numor patted her shoulder and moved to another seat, one not so close. The badger settled across the fire from the two mortals. Broadfoot was there already, half tucked under a fallen log. Dane, what in the name of all the gods is going on on that bridge? The badger demanded. It looked as if you were dancing. The girl rubbed an aching temple and sipped her tea. She felt weak and watery, a bit like tea herself. It's these darkings. She explained what had taken place, while the darking that had saved her arrows nodded vigorously. Somewhere it had acquired a faint streak of gold through its body, color that filled the tiny head that it fashioned for itself. Seemingly they were fighting, or disagreeing, the girl finished, and then I saw Ozorn. She bit her lip. There was another time, when the Taurus almost got me. A darking was in the water. Was that you? she asked. The gold-smeared blot nodded. I saw Ozorn then, too. Inside him. She pointed to the darking. You never mentioned this. Numa remarked, eyes glittering dangerously. She stiffened. I had other things to worry about. I thought maybe I saw Orzorn because the darkings are liquid, kind of, but they aren't, are they? Her gold-streaked companion shook its head. We need answers, said Broadfoot. Where is the spy? In your pouch still? The leather purse thumped at the girl's belt, the creature inside trying to free itself. Oh, end of another one. Another... Asked Numer, his brows coming together in a frown. It dropped off the hurrock that cut my head. I think it deserted to our side. Broadfoot waddled over to Dane and cut a circle in the earth with a claw. Before he closed it, he told the gold touch darking, Inside, you. The shadowy thing cowered away from him. It won't hurt, the badger said. Getting answers in other ways takes too long. But Ma tried that, protested the girl. She only got its name. Because that was what she asked for. Broadfoot replied, we're doing something else. Stop dawdling. Flattening itself like an anxious dog, the gold streak darking trickled across the ground unwillingly. It hesitated outside the mark in the earth, then flowed into the circle. The duck mole looked up at the girl. Where's this new darking? Dane fished out the deserter. Go with your friend. 
She put it on the ground, and the darking rolled into the circle. Now the third, said Broadfoot. Quickly the girl upended her belt purse over the circle. Her captive fell out with a plop. Broadfoot closed the circle. The darking from the pouch surged against the line in the ground and flattened as if it had met a wall of glass. Stand back, ordered the duck mole. Opening his bill, he uttered a strange noise, half croak, half bark. Silver fire bloomed over the darkings, who shrank away from it. With glittering light stretched, deep within, a picture began to form. There was Osorn, streaked with soot, cuts on his face and chest, a clump of braid singed. At his throat he wore a black, glossy stone on a frayed cord. His lips moved as if he talked to himself. The view spread. The former emperor mage stood alone in a cave, a pool of water at his feet. Outside the entrance, snow fell in a thick veil. An image formed in the water. It showed Dane as she read a book. Osorn reached for her. When his outstretched wing touched the water, she disappeared. Though the image was soundless, they could see him shriek, bearing sharp silver teeth. Veins in his chest, neck, and face stood against his skin. He spun and came to an abrupt halt, a look of sudden cleverness on his face. His lips moved. A thick worm of gold-edged scarlet fire appeared before him. So he'd mastered storming magic by winter, murmured Numer, possibly even before the barriers between the realms collapsed. This is months ago, said the badger. I remember this blizzard. We don't have that many, even here in the colder climates. It was the first full moon after midwinter, the wolf moon. Neatly, Osorn cut his cheek on a razor-edged feather. The fiery worm flew to the cut, battening on it as a leech might. Osorn spoke again. The tube fell away, turning into a bowl as it moved back. It brimmed with dark blood. Lurching through the pool, Osorn drank. When he straightened, his eyes were bright. He grinned. Returning to the magical bowl, he breathed a red-gold mist on its surface. It sank into the depths of the blood and swirled, making wavy patterns. Quickly the storm wing cut both lips, flicking the blood drops into the bowl. For speaking, guessed Numer, engrossed. Blood also for life, and to bind the fruits of the working to him. He couldn't have done it as a mortal, but here... Here, magical laws are what you make them, Broadfoot said. He seems to have learned that better than most who were born immortal. Numer raised an eyebrow. I doubt that he learned that at all, Osorn's one-time friend replied. He merely wanted to do the thing, and so he forced it to happen. Subtlety has never been his strong suit. Again that delicate flick of a feather edge. This time across each ear, the blood went into the bowl. Closing both eyes, Osorn raised the same wing feather. Even more carefully, he just nicked the skin of his eyelids, producing two scant drops to add to what he'd already gathered. Slowly he raised his wings, pointing at the cave ceiling. As he did, the liquid surged upward. Osorn lowered his wings. The bulge remained. Twice more he repeated the motion. Each time the liquid in the bowl rose higher. After the third raising, it formed a red-black column nearly eighteen inches tall. Osorn was sweating. Now he shouted. The bowl vanished. Its contents dropped, breaking into a myriad of blobs. Each turned black. The Stormwing's face was mirrored in each newborn darking. The vision dissolved. Only the trio of darkings remained. There you have it, said the duck mole. He broke the circle to release the captives. Your enemy made them to serve as his voice, eyes, and ears. Free, the Darkings did not try to escape. Instead, they created heads for themselves so that they could nod. Again, Dane noticed that one still contained a streak of gold. Somehow, while in the circle, another had picked up a small leaf. This it wore on its head, like an absurd hat. She was nearly positive that the third, the plain shivering one, was the Darking that had dropped from the Hurrock. So you are Osorn's spies, she said. The answer was a head shake, first on the gold one's part, then on that of the one that bore the leaf. The third blot shrank lower to the ground, trembling. You showed Osorn that we were at the bridge, Numa reminded them. Goldstreak pointed an accusatory tentacle at Leaf. You'll do it again when he summons you, growled the badger. The answer was emphatic head shakes from the gold-tinged and leaf-wearing blots. The third shrank against the other two. But he created you, Numer said. Goldstreak began to tremble. Don't be afraid, Dane said. You needn't... I don't think it's fear, interrupted Numer. It's trying something new, added the duckmole. Wait. 
The streaked darkening's companions leaned against it to somehow give it strength. An image formed in Gold Streak's depths, growing to cover its surface. There was Stormwing Osorn. He glared at a darkening on the ground before him. Obey, whispered Osorn. Its victim began to shrill. The darkings with Dane and her friend shrilled too, tiny voices rising and falling. When the image vanished, they stopped. He hurts you, Dane said. Is that why? Goldstreak showed a fresh image, a red-clad female giant, a blot's eye view of Dane, as she tugged an arrow shaft away from the onlooker's vision. That picture blurred to form a fresh image. Your leg, isn't it? asked Numer, grinning. From the foot up? A large hand came into view, cheese in its fingers. It dropped the scrap and pulled away. You fed it. The badger sighed. Sometimes I think you'll feed anything. You were trying to warn me? In the pond? Asked Dane. The visions disappeared. The tinted darking nodded. And on the bridge? Your friend here, Leaf, and your gold streak, and this little fellow. She scratched her head, looking at the trembling creature. You'll be jelly. The darking shiver slowed, though they didn't stop. It rose a bit in the middle, no longer trying to merge with the ground. So on the bridge, Leaf was reporting to Osorn. Goldstreak, you tried to put Leaf in the pouch to keep Osorn from seeing where I was, but it was too late. Osorn had already sent the Hurrocks. You hadn't told Leaf not to do as Osorn bids you. Both Goldstreak and Leaf nodded. She looked at Jelly. And you abandoned the Hurrock when you saw I had Goldstreak? A bump that might have been a head lifted in Jelly's mass. Stiffly, it shook its new head. Or did Goldstreak call to you? inquired the girl. Jelly nodded. The badger chuckled. Osorn mastered Stormwing magic, he remarked, but he created the Darkings here. Are you sure? inquired Numa. That cave may have been in the mortal realms. He did it here, Broadfoot said firmly. We gods can always tell the difference. Here, life is forbidden to remain a slave of its creator, explained the badger. It's why so many children and servants of gods act against the interests of those who gave them life. The Darkings are forming their own ideas and ways to communicate, and they're getting names. They're his blood, argued Numer. Blood will bind anything. How can they refuse when he commands? I don't know, but they can. Dane looked at the gold-tinted blot. This morning, I heard Osorn say, Number 14, report. I thought I dreamed it, but I didn't. Goldstreak was still in my pack then, so Osorn couldn't see where we were. Goldstreak refused to tell him. Goldstreak nodded vigorously. That's why Osorn sent Leaf. Because he couldn't make you tell, and Jelly chose to be with you, not Osorn. Both Leaf and Goldstreak nodded. Dane picked up Jelly. You were brave to jump off that hurrock, she told it gently. Why don't you talk to Leaf and Goldstreak a bit and hear what they have to say? The Darking nodded, then, abruptly, rubbed its head against her thumb before she put it down. The three came together in a shadowy pool. Dane realized that she was exhausted. We'd best turn in, Numer said, eyes on her. We've had a long day. Doubtless tomorrow will be longer still. The girl dug in her pack for her blanket. We will stand guard, the badger said. Broadfoot and I have things to discuss. Dane's last awareness was of the badger and the duckmole rocking to and fro, their heads together as they conferred mind to mind. Rattail, who Dane was now sure spoke with the Dream King's voice, awaited her when she fell asleep. Again she called the girl's attention to the changing creature that was Use, the Queen of Chaos, surrounded by the great gods who kept her captive. The fiery barrier between her and them blazed. Dane couldn't see her under that bright light, but she could feel the creature's changes, and wished very much that she could not. Behind the great gods, multicolored liquid ran, not as puddles that spread and merged, but as a stream that whirled in a circle, seeming to flow both right and left at the same time. Watching it made the girl feel giddy. Suddenly columns leaped from the stream, rising and curving over the gods. If the columns met at the peak of the circle, the gods would be under a bowl of chaos light, just as Use was under a bowl of light. White fire winked into existence at the backs of the gods. Instantly, the columns turned to spinning drills, trying to bore their way through. The second barrier flickered. "'I hope you don't expect me to get excited over all this,' Dane remarked, finding that she could speak for the first time. "'Or that you mean the gods want my help.' Part of her quivered at speaking so lightly of the gods. She rudely stepped on that fright. 
I can't help the gods against chaos. I have troubles of my own, back home. It's not as if they came to our aid when the barrier between us and them gave way at midwinter. Why in the name of Father Universe would they meddle in that? demanded Rattail. The barrier was made by human mages, who never asked permission to do it. I still don't understand why you're showing me all this, the girl told her stubbornly. It's like I'm being asked for help. Forget it. I've none to give. A paw cuffed her soundly on the ear, knocking her over. Suddenly she was pup-sized. Rattail towered over her as she had over her own wolf pups. You cannot have been attending to the duck mole then, the wolf told her sternly. Look there. Planting her nose on Dane's behind, she scooted the girl forward. Before them was the image that Dane had just seen, with the columns of shifting light connecting over the heads of the gods. They spread to cover the outer barrier. Mouths, distorted with jagged, sharp, and weirdly angled teeth, opened throughout the cover of chaos light and sank within it. Suddenly, everything sagged inward. Dane felt the white light barriers evaporate within her very bones. Shapes thrashed under the rippling, glimmering chaos stuff as it fell inward. At the center was Use, born from the muck that she commanded, her eyes, when she had them, shining with triumph. She opened a mouth with swords for teeth and sprouted a hundred arms. They lashed out, seizing animals and two-legged gods from seemingly empty air, carrying each to the Chaos Queen's jaws. She ate and ate and ate. Blood of all colors streamed over her chin and body and was soaked up to add its colors to the muck in which she stood. The last two struggling figures she raised to her lips were Sarah and the Badger. With a gasp, Dane sat up, eyes open. Her curls and skin were dripping sweat. Sometime in the night she had thrown off the cover. It lay beneath her, dragged into folds and ridges. Her head and back ached. Numbers 11, 27, 14, report! That voice is Ozorn's. The girl looked around for the darkings. How dare you defy me! The commands issued from Dane's pack, where the blots had spent the night. If you will not show what I wish. Crimson light shone through openings in the pack. The darkings keen, tiny voices shrill. He was hurting them. She yanked the flap open, furious. Black tentacles streaked with red veins reached out to pull it shut again. The darkings wanted her to stay out. Rather than listen, she went to the pool to clean up. It took her longer than usual. She was trembling with rage and dropped things. The sky in the east was just turning pink. Did you hear me? Numer stood on the rise near their camp, wearing only his breeches, hair tousled. It's how our enemies seem to know every move. Dane rubbed her face with her hands. I didn't hear. It's the darkings. They're the answer. She felt a powerful urge to yank him into the pond, just for being awake and chatty, let alone for having poked up the fire and set tea water on to boil. Mastering the urge, barely, the girl returned to her pack. The darkings came out. She cuddled them, asking if they were all right. All three nodded, but Jelly quivered more than ever, and even Goldstreak and Leaf were trembly. The badger waddled over to her. Did you dream? Dane glared at him. I dreamed, all right, she said grimly. Amazingly clear dreams, like all the ones I've been having here. Amazing and long, since I don't remember sleeping much. Numer scooped up the darkings. It's these little fellows, he said. Or ladies, he added, squinting at them. It's impossible to tell if you have a sex. There was a splash. Rodfoot climbed out of the pool, a small fish in his bill. The resurrected fish god that had supplied his breakfast leaped from the water, splashing him. What about the darkings? he asked. They don't just spy on us, Numer said. I thought Osorn had created a number far in excess of his needs, if they were solely to keep an eye on Dane or me. Your kinfolk are with our leaders, aren't they? He asked the Darkings. The king, the queen. In the north, Dane said, realizing what he meant. I heard in a dream that the Scarens got away clean. Somehow they knew the Yamini fleet was coming. As I woke, I heard that yesterday the Seventh Riders tried to use a secret exit from Legan. Numer added quietly. The enemy was waiting. Three of the Riders are dead. Dane clenched her teeth. She had friends in the Seventh Riders. Their commander, Evan Lars, had pulled a roll from her ear the first time she'd eaten at the Rider mess. She looked a question at Numer. I don't know who they were, Magelet, he said gently, smoothing a wet curl off her forehead. No one mentioned names. She nodded and made herself think about the immediate problem. The Darking spies tell Osorn, and other Darkings with his commanders pass it on, she whispered. That... 
tongue fouled, mold eating. She faced the badger, eyes blazing. You could put an end to it. The great gods don't like the people's gods to intervene in human affairs, the badger replied. We are to keep to doings of our own children. You've always said I mean as much as your own kits. She knelt beside him. Badger, please. I can't help them at home whilst I'm here, but you can. Please. The badger fluffed out his fur, snorted, and stamped. What good is knowing that your friends have eavesdroppers? asked Broadfoot. The Darkings are very good at hiding. There are general spells to make an area secure, Numer said hesitantly. I would hope that the Darkings aren't immune to their effects. Of course, chances are that our friends are using such spells now to hamper the enemy's spy mages. Colors rippled over Gold Streak's skin. The other two blots flowed into it to form a single quivering mass. They seemed to be conferring. Movement in the pot where Numa was brewing their tea caught Dane's eye. On top of the curtain wall at Port Legan, Taka the Basilisk stood by Kitten. Yellow fog was drifting through the air over their heads. The wyverns were on the attack once more. A burning log snapped, throwing up sparks, and the image dissolved. Mute, Dane pulled off the silver claw that hung around her neck, the symbol of the tie between her and the badger. She held it out to him. I'm asking you now, by this symbol of the bond that's between us, please help my friends. The badger waffled, wet nose quivering. If it helps, I will take them as far as I can, the duck mole told his fellow god. What is it, Gold Streak? Numor asked. The three darkings were surging up and down beside Dane, reminding her of children trying to get an elder's attention. Goldstreak had stretched until it stood taller than leaf and jelly. To her surprise, a slit opened in the knob that served Goldstreak as a head. The opening moved. A squeak reached the girl's ears. Quickly she bent down so that her ear was close to the blots. I go, repeated Goldstreak. Its voice was tiny. <laughs>